freaking out, man. You can't handle the truth. You can't handle the truth. What do all men power want? More power. Ok guys, second hours, love guns and freedom, uh, K-Talks 13.40 a.m. Before we start with the two new guests we have, you know, I really like talk about gun shops. Because when I go to gun shop, I feel like I'm going to church when I was a kid in Italy. Something in the air, smelled good. You know, normally in Italy I used to like the classic uh, Catholic churches with all the incense and the Gregorian chants. Even I'm not a really a Catholic because I believe the Pope is just another man. I'm not into that type of stuff, but I like the atmosphere. I feel kind of mystic. When I go into a gun shop, I feel mystic too. Especially if somebody just shot something, there is this burning powder uh, still on their clothes, you know, kind of interesting. And more important, the metal and all this rifle line up gave me joy to my eyes. That's why normally when I have guns, I hate to put them in the safe because I like to line them up. I have a dream to put like a huge wall and might put my gun collection. I got more than 100 rifles and I love to put them all out. You know, so uh, ATF, I'm sure you're listening. Uh, guess what? You can suck it, okay? Anyway, now let's talk about... Here we have also, by the way, some uh, great guys uh, coming from uh, Wisconsin, a place that must be very cold right now, but they are traveling and walking through the States. We have uh, two names, of course, Anthony Anderson and Tom Voss. Hi, guys. Are you there? Hi, how are you doing? We are here. Hi. I'm so glad today you're here because... Uh, you don't know, when I became an American, I did, I, it was 1998, I wanted to decide what I wanted to do. Okay? I said, what am I going to do here? I want to do something nice, something important, something that made me feel like was a purpose for me. So I wanted maybe to join the army. And I, it was a process. I wanted to learn what's going on. And I went to a recruiting office in Los Angeles. And I really meant for me was important because in World War II, uh, my family was rescued by American soldiers in Anzio. So I was in a real commitment to pay back what I got from your parents or your grandparents. So it was honestly a true feeling. Then I started to realize that we need soldiers here in our cities. It means uh, as Americans, we need to be here because the fight for our freedom, it's happening here on our land. And when I started to understand what they were doing and also who was behind uh, you know, the military industrial complex, and even a part of me, I still wanted to become a soldier. I said, maybe in this life, I need to stick to be here as a family man, as a person involved fighting for our freedoms with us. But I respect a lot everyone that believes in uh, the Constitution and wants to uh, take an oath like you did. So let's talk a little bit about you. First, what are you doing, guys? I mean, you're walking from Wisconsin to Los Angeles in this weather? Why? Yeah, we, uh, we left from uh, Wisconsin um, August 30th, from basically from Lake Michigan. Um, and then we decided that, you know, we were going to walk from Wisconsin to Los Angeles. Um, the, the reason why we're doing that, um, there's three reasons. One, um, we're raising uh, funds for a nonprofit back in Wisconsin uh, called Dry Hooch of America. Um, you can check them out at uh, dryhooch.org. Um, so our goal is $100,000 for them. And uh, right now we've raised about like 60, 67,000. Uh, um, so we're, we're almost to our goal. Wow. And uh, the second reason, um, we really wanted to kind of... Uh, uh, bring attention to a lot of the veteran issues that are going on right now. So, like substance abuse, uh, homelessness, suicide. I mean, uh, okay. tw- 22 veterans are killing themselves every day. Wow. So, um, it, it's a real problem, and we uh, would like to reach out to the uh, non veteran community and let them know what's really going on. Uh, third reason um, we are trying to take some time ourselves, Anthony and I to uh, kind of sort through some things that we went through on our deployments. Uh, We really feel that we didn't really have a lot of time to kind of process um, our our deployment. So those are the uh, three reasons why. How many many weeks uh, have you been walking so far since you started the project? Uh, We're at 17 weeks now. 17 weeks. We should be done in three weeks and that would be five months. All by foot. All by foot. No cheating. No, I mean, when we were in southern Colorado, we had to take a ride through the mountains because the weather flipped. So we told everyone on our website, you know, this is yeah. what we have to do. But otherwise, wow. uh, no, we just walk a lot. That's for sure. It's a good uh, 
boot training camp. I mean, you can say yeah. we got a good training camp. Yeah. Talking about your, first of all, you served both in the army. Yeah, correct. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, different stories. You, you didn't know each other before this experience, right? No. So you met right now. Uh, let's talk about first with, I don't know, I'm just still guessing the names. Okay, Tom. Anthony. Hey, here we go. I knew it. <laughs> Tom, uh, when did you join the Army and why? What is uh, the call? Yes. Um, I joined um, in, in January of uh, 2003. And, um, you know, one of the reasons why I joined was that Um, I had a grandfather who uh, fought on Iwo Jima, and uh, I really looked up to him. And, uh, you know, I always uh, thought his service was really honorable, you know, and he was a Marine. Um, and at, at the time, um, you know, not, you know, 9-11 had happened. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a lot of, uh, um, you know, stuff going on. And uh, I really didn't uh, feel like I wanted to go to college, but I, I, I really didn't know what I really wanted to do. So... Um, you know, I thought that I would pay for college myself by uh, joining the military, um, enlisted as uh, infantry. Um, and then from there, you know, I was uh, uh, stationed out of Fort Lewis, Washington, uh, 25th ID. Perfect. And what's about you? Uh, I joined the Guard in Wisconsin in 2002. Um, my whole life, my family had always stressed service to the community. My dad was a teacher. My grandma was always really um, involved in local politics, stuff like that. Um, so when I joined, you know, my family said, we'll pay for one year of college. You've got to figure out what you want to do after that. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was a teenager, I went in to talk to a Marine recruiter, and it was like the worst recruiter uh, of all time. <laughs> so I wanted to join when I was 17. I ended up joining the military when I was 19. Um, I went to basic in 2003. Um, the volunteered for my first deployment to Iraq in 2004. Did that deployment, came back for a year and a half, volunteered for another one. And I uh, went back again 2007 to 2008, again, in the infantry like Tom. Um, it just kind of, I felt like it was something I needed to do. I remember after 9-11 happened, I was a freshman in college, and uh, my parents called me. I think they probably could feel something in the air because they told me, don't run out and enlist in the military because mm-hmm. I had talked about it before. Um, so a year later, I did. Wow. Question, guys. Mm-hmm. So you both went to overseas, right? Yeah, correct. Okay. Exactly the same uh, country, Iraq, both of you? Yeah. Correct. So mm-hmm. you never met each other there? You never crossed each no, other? No, I, uh, I was deployed to uh, Mosul, Iraq. So okay. I was up north, and Anthony was uh, down in Baghdad from 04 to 05. I want to go straight to the point, okay? Because uh, I remember the first few weeks and months, 9-11, you know, we watched television. I call it propaganda. I blast my last TV is no more there, because I understand it was part of the problem, in my opinion. They control the news. And but the point is, at the time, I really believed that, yes, there was, uh, we were attacked, and according to the information I had, I mean, in good faith, you know, I mean, we do what we can in our good faith. Then, you start to, we're supposed to go there because uh, there were weapons of mass destruction. I mean, that was the, remember the speeches, you know, and the different thing in front of the United Nations. Then you learn directly from the mouth of the devil, Mr. George W. Bush. I mean, that's what he said. I have here is a statement that during um, one press conference, it was August 21st, 2006. He admitted it. And there is also the video and the transcript that Iraq had no weapons of mass destruction and also had nothing to do with 9-11. Do you agree with this statement of Mr. President Bush or you think it's different, first of all? Well, when I went, I knew that they had nothing to do with 9-11. It had always been something with uh, uh, the Taliban, Mm Al-Qaeda, Afghanistan. Um, At that time, though, a lot of people, they would feed on fear. Mm -hmm. So I remember many times hearing, like, do you want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud? Mm -hmm. Do you want this person, the axis of evil? You know, they'd go in front of the entire country and talk about that stuff. And so you get get, uh, scared about that, and you want to make sure that you protect you know, what you have and your family and stuff like that, so you kind of go along with it. Mm -hmm. Um, In my time in Iraq, I never saw any weapons of mass destruction or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And, yeah, I don't think they had anything to do with any of the stuff or why we went there. And uh, Tom? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I I, I totally agree. I I had no uh, experience while I was over there that, you know, led me to believe that there were weapons of mass destruction there. You know, because I, you know, sometimes, you know, what I really realized when I started to understand, I became an American, and, you know, unfortunately, there are some people 
that they try to hide behind honorable people, soldiers, veterans, for their own personal purposes and economic advantage or political advantage. And I find very disgusting. I'm not even a soldier. If I was a soldier, I would be very irritated. Mm -hmm. There are people out there, politicians, they never saw a, fight, a real combat, not even a punch in their face. They don't have any kids out there dying or risking their life. And they all talk about wars or, you know, that it's not even a war anymore. Because I would like to educate the people out there listening. They probably already know. You confirm me, please, if you agree. The last real war we fought, according to the Constitution declared by Congress, was World War II. Everything after that, uh, Korea, Vietnam, and this uh, Iraq, one, two, and three, whatever, they were all under United Nations as a police uh, action, international police action. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the command is not even anymore under our own uh, real, uh, let's say, executive or command in chief, it's under global government, it's under the United Nations. If people understand that, when they say, oh, the war, you cannot even call it war, because technically, you know, you're not even, uh, it's not technically a war anymore. There was not declared by Congress, right? Right. No, at the time, um, if I remember correctly, they were going after another resolution. Resolution. And uh, when the resolution wasn't met, they mm -hmm. said, well, this is grounds for war. Mm -hmm. um, it was more of like, look, the United Nations, the world, the world government, they agree with it. Yeah. So this is what we're going to do. They never really asked the American people. And the American people, I think, kind of thought, well, look, this is what the world wants. So this is what our leaders want. So this is what we must want. This is American blood, American money. I don't care about the world. We should be in charge. That's why our founders, you know, you know better than me. You were born here. You studied better than I know. They put that type of very special power to declare war only to Congress. It mm -hmm. pretty much represents mm -hmm. the people, the American people, not the world mm -hmm. government people, you know. So anyway, I'm glad because, you know, we want to, my, my goal here with you is, uh, first of all, share your experiences, mm -hmm. why you're here, what mm -hmm. you've seen, because I wasn't there, mm -hmm. and then trying to verify what I know as just uh, somebody that is trying to learn from different sources, mm -hmm. uh, to verify that we have some sort of, uh, you know, common uh, information together. So I'm glad that you're uh, smart and educated to understand that, yes, this is no more about war, the last war we fought according to the Constitution. So everybody that supports the war, please, this was even a war. You were pretty much obeying and uh, complying with the global government with this police state force, like, you know, when it was in the 90s, you know, Europe, all the different things. Anyway, interesting. Thank you. Now, Let's talk about your service. What, when, oh, let's start with, start with Tom. Tom, mm -hmm. when you were in Iraq, what was your job? Um, I was a battalion scout. Um, so basically what my job was is, you know, reconnaissance. Okay. So um, we get orders from our battalion commander, whether it's, you know, to, um, you know, get a 72-hour op on um, a location, a house, a person, mm -hmm. um, whatever intelligence that they're trying to gather. Um, we also had a uh, sniper squad mm -hmm. uh, attached to us as well. So we'd go out on, you know, sniper missions, regular patrols, and we we're a pretty versatile pl platoon. So whatever the battalion commander needed us to do is, is really what we did. So we spent a lot of time, um, you know, going through, um, you know, high value target lists what, trying to find uh, people. What was uh, your rifle that you were uh, trained with or you were carrying there? Um, I, I was trained, you know, M4, 240 Bravo, mm -hmm. um, uh, 203 grenade launcher. Those were the main ones that I used while I was over there. So you were that pretty much at your mm -hmm. basic rifle. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about you, Anthony. What did you do there when you were there? Uh, well, both my deployments were pretty different. On my first one, we provided uh, predominantly the security for the battalion commander when he'd want to go out into the AO and he was pretty active so we'd go out several times a week um, the first round of free elections in Iraq we provided security so people could come out to the polling stations go do uh, presence patrol stuff like that on my second deployment we did a uh, convoy escort for the uh, KBR the mm -hmm. contractors okay we'll so they'd want to go you know from um, maybe 20 miles to across the country then we'd have to provide the security for them, and they'd deliver anything from water and ice to uh, machine parts to medical equipment, stuff like that. Okay, let's talk about, since the uh, next question was going to be, did you ever work, guys, in uh, 
close contact or collaborated with private, contact, co private contractors in Iraq. Uh, your experience with the KBR, sure. uh, tell me any s situation that uh, you would like to talk about, something interesting that the public and taxpayers should know, because you know, in my own personal experience, when I watched World War II movies, I remember that uh, the army itself take care of cleaning their shoes, and there is a cook that mm -hmm. uh, take care of food. Now, the latest uh, news I saw on TV the last few years, we pretty much subcontract almost everything, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm just telling you what I've seen from outside. For example, the meals, they were more the army uh, cook doing, yeah. the, it's all some sort of a high price, overpriced contractor preparing meals. Same things with washing, for example, your clothing. Anything uh, you can confirm sure, about like, that? Um, Again, both my deployments are very different, but on my first deployment, we would have a KBR detail. So one day I had to go around with a KBR electrician, and I basically had to make sure, you know, that he was following the rules. And I knew that they made a lot of money. And so I just asked him one day, like, why are you here? And he said, well, it's a job. And I said, oh, yeah, you make a lot of money. And he said, the first 80000 is tax-free. Wow. All I did with them was watch them change light bulbs. <laughs> the second time I went, we provide security, like I said, from base to base. And uh, my first mission when I came back from leave, so this would have been in, like, January of 2008, I was tasked with the mission to take people from uh, LSA Anaconda and Balad all the way down by Kuwait. And we took empty flatbed trailers down. They unhooked them. They brought empty flatbed trailers up. Wow. And I asked the guy, I said, so do you guys just have to do, like, maintenance on these things, like swap them out every now and then? And he said, no, we have a quota of missions we have to run, so many miles we have to do. So if we don't have anything to deliver, we still go out. Wow. And I remember how upset I felt about that because I had just exposed myself, all the people that I was in charge of, all the equipment that I was in charge of, uh, driving through Iraq. Wow. But, just so they could make a financial quota, a miles quota. And that's why really, you know, because I really f feel sorry for this country and for the next generation, what's happening here. I mean, we've been used, you've been used, but we've been used too as, as a, for something that is bigger that we can understand. I mean, they're using our names, our money, our reputation. I mean, when you tell me something like that, and I already have some information that confirm what you're saying, of course, you were there. When uh, the military industrial complex, the uh, President Eisenhower, the speech yeah, that straight up uh, yeah, I mean I have a beginning of the show mm -hmm. everybody that today in this uh, time still believe that we must go out there without even knowing why going to war maybe we should learn a little bit the basic first of all let's think about the constitution uh, war means congress means people accountable number one Number two, let's see also the military industrial complex because it's a perfect example. I mean, you tell me you risk your life, put yourself and your man in jeopardy to come back maybe on a wheelchair just because somebody must make an extra buck, I'm talking about a lot of money, to carry an empty uh, trailer just to, to reach their quotas. This is really sad. I mean, this is really mm -hmm. sad. And if I was a guy, a military guy, and I see these things, I would be definitely a threat. That's why I, and I want to go to this point, not because I'm a violent person, because I would speak up like you're doing to the people to unveil the fraud. And are you aware that returning veterans, according to different federal governments from Homeland Security, not just this one, but also the other one, the Bush administration, also, of course, Obama, you are potentially one number one domestic terrorist threats. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know that. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I mean, your government trusts you to go to war and now you come back and you're bad people. Well, like for me, I've said many times, I knew that I would be considered a threat. I'm white, middle class, gun owning, third party voting, uh, military veteran, all these different things. Like, I think just by existing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, you're considered a threat. Yeah. But when you have additional training, when you see things for what they are, um, just by your very existence, you're considered a threat. So it doesn't surprise me. I know that when I heard, I think it was in 2009, I think uh, Janet Napolitano, yeah. she was talking about how uh, the returning veterans were a threat mm -hmm. domestically, and a lot of people kind of went crazy about that. Yeah, It didn't surprise me to hear that yeah. at all. I mean, I, it just kind of confirmed what I thought people already thought about me. Um, it's different when you think, there's a public perception about what a veteran is, yeah. and you're kind of, you know, honor them, put the magnet on your car, stuff mm -hmm. like that. And then there's the reality of what being a veteran is in the country uh, today. 
um, it doesn't add up. The rhetoric versus the reality, they don't match. And then I'm going to ask you exactly what is the difference, okay? All, the, all your thought, because I want to ask you now to Tom, mm -hmm. uh, your, experience, I mean, your opinion about this uh, domestic terrorist stuff. I, mean, um, I think, you know, uh, the, just the way that veterans are, are being treated, I, I mean, I feel that they expect that uh, title. You know, I mean, we come back um, and basically once you're separated uh, from the military, you know, you get the feeling that they don't want anything to do with you. And then you have, um, you know, um, recent developments like having uh, pensions cut and, mm -hmm. um, you know, just I mean, the way the way that they, they treat veterans, you know, you know, all signs point to them, you know, viewing us as a threat. So coming back to your point, uh, Anthony. Uh, Besides, you know, the people that would like to show your support, you know, they put a little flag and a little yellow ribbon, all this thing. I mean, maybe my opinion would be better, maybe it would be the most honest thing to know to support you guys. First of all, to know the truth mm -hmm. or really what you went through. I mean, not the one that uh, the different cable networks try to tell us. I mean, to know exactly the whole truth, you know, that because that's... One second, let me dump it. Okay, it's gone. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so... Cell phone, never leave the cell phone on on the air. <laughs> anyway, so that's my point because I like to see, you know, many people, especially in some uh, conservative uh, environments, you know, they think, oh, let's support the troop. Great, mm -hmm. I am all for it. But yeah. I think the most honest way to support you guys is first of all, we want to know the truth. Right. And you are the one, better than any politicians coming to a town hall meeting, tell us right. the truth. I mean, the politician, it's, it's nothing. But I mean, even that saying is just. You know, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. You know, what do you mean support our troops? Exactly. You know, I mean, what, you know, you need to be, you know, you have to have a plan of action mm -hmm. to do something. They're Tell considered it. like virtue words. Mm -hmm. They're things that people say to try to give you like a warm, fuzzy feeling. Yeah. Well, that huh. makes you feel as though you're doing something. Uh -huh. um, you know, there's a lot of things that we hear every day. Things like uh, democracy, support, truth, yeah. honesty, things like yeah. that, that you want to be associated with. So when you hear someone say yeah. it. Yeah. You say, that's what I want to be like, so okay. then you feel as though you're acting. Yeah. There's a big difference between action and advocacy. Exactly. There's a huge difference. Talking about exactly this organization, at uh, pretty much the core of what you're doing here, I mean, dry, correct me if I misspell it mm -hmm. or my accent sucks, okay? Dry hooch. Yes. Mm -hmm. I practiced last yeah. night. <laughs> so what does it mean, first of all? Sure. So um, in the military, a hooch is a place where you stay. Yeah. So your room, anything like that. It's also slang for, for alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, the concept of dry hooch is to have a safe, sober environment for veterans to come back. It's all based on peer-to-peer -peer support, okay. no clinical interventions or anything like that. So the name is pretty much derived from like dry alcohol, that's the coffee shop, mm -hmm. or just like a safe place for you to be around other veterans, re-experience some of the camaraderie that maybe you miss. And a lot of veterans, when you ask them what they miss most about the military, the first thing they say is the camaraderie. Yes. Being around the other guys. The organization is a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, they try their hardest to work within the community to meet veterans where they are in the community to meet their needs. They have small veteran led support groups on things ranging from post traumatic stress disorder to substance abuse, uh, just military, like basically reintegration, um, just anything. Like if the needs of the veterans are there, then they're there to meet the needs. And what kind of works best is that it's all veterans doing it. They know the experience. They can empathize. It's not just sympathy. Yes. You know, they understand where you're coming from. So you're both really physically involved into this process of mm -hmm. healing and helping. I mean, you no, know, like, let's support the troop. I mean, you're really mm -hmm. doing the job. Right. That's yeah. Yeah. And today, of course, you try to share this information so people can support also, maybe make a little donation, something yep. like that. Yep. If people want to donate, what is the website? Sure, you can go to our website. It's www.veteranstrek.com. Uh, there will be a donate button on top. Any money that you donate to us um, over the course of this walk, all of it goes to dryhooch.org. Okay. All of it. Um, like Tom said earlier, we're about sixty-seven to seventy thousand dollars raised so far. That's great. Um, out of our hundred thousand dollar goal. That's great, especially now with this economy. This is yeah. great. I mean, you have uh, completely, uh, for what I understand, because I found you by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. You know, Charles. Uh, you know, my friend. Uh, and that's what I see. It's Facebook pretty much. It's a grassroots. I mean, just people talking to each other. And today we're here because, we you know, we met. Uh, yeah. So it's completely spontaneous. I really like that. You know, I think it's the spirit that we should all pursue. In, in, uh, so I would like to re remind, remind everybody, please, I know the times are tough. 
But even if you get out, you know, offer them a coffee, okay? I mean, no, it doesn't even go to them. It goes for a cost. A couple of dollars that so we can wait, say, save and spare from some expensive overpriced coffee place. We can do a good thing. I will do myself my little job today. So, excellent. Now, I like to go back and forth, you know, dry hooch and guns and stuff like that. So, okay. So, what is your rifle of choice in case you have to go to defend this republic again? Uh, my rifle at home is a Rock River LAR-8. So, it's exactly what I carried in Iraq and M16A4 mm -hmm. except in 308 caliber. Okay. Um, some shotguns. I have some pistols, stuff like that. Okay. And you, tell me what's your rifle of choice. If you have one rifle only to get out, hey, this is the time. Right. The enemy says at the gate. Yeah. Uh, Gather your men. Yeah. Let's go. It would definitely have to be a uh, definitely an M4. Okay. You know, uh, most, most You're trained with that. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. You know, I like it more. Of course, I didn't have the training you had, but you know, I do my own little civilian training. I, I I'm a life member at front side, and if I had to do one rifle only, I like the M14. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I think 308, 762 by 51. You know, I can do almost everything with the soft tissue, even bears and things like that, you know, even if I do somehow. But, you know, I like the 5.56, five, especially for, uh, you know, lightness. And but after all, I always say the rifle is just an extension of your soul and your freedom because mm -hmm. it's not about the rifle, it's about your brain. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I use my rifle for hunting back home. Uh -huh. you what do you hunt with that? Uh, deer. Deer, can you do legally deer in some states? I know mm -hmm. that I heard, I'm not, I'm not a hunter, I'm not an expert, but I know that uh, some uh, states, they have limitation with that 5.56, five, what you can hunt. Mm, where we're from, you can hunt with anything above a 22. Okay, interesting. Um, so I didn't want to use, I wanted, you know, the quote unquote assault rifle, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the platform that I was comfortable yeah. with. But I also wanted to drop the deer where it stood. I didn't yeah. want to have to go track it, so okay. I just bumped it up to 308. When you were in Iraq, did you also have a chance to train with other rifles like AK-47 or Dragunov or Russian stuff? Uh, most most of the, my uh, experience with uh, Russian weaponry was just like confiscated. Confiscated. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, yeah, that's you know, pretty much it. You it come really, across it, mm -hmm. you pick it up and take it, but you never yeah. really get to. You couldn't get anything for yourself, personal souvenir, home? No, nope. that's oh. highly illegal. <laughs> <laughs> highly illegal. You know, okay, yeah. that's too bad. I like to collect original guns. All right, interesting, interesting. So now let's talk about what they were. I mean, rules of engagement. Okay, I mean, we know stories from uh, different generations. You know, I read. Mm -hmm. Vietnam was kind of a setup, you know, people were there and almost sitting ducks, seriously, our veterans there. What, 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 what happened in Iraq during your deployment? What were your rules of engagement when you were there? Um, I mean, from when we were there, the, I mean, they've drastically changed. I think they change all the time. Mm -hmm. But um, um, we, we were allowed to, if we were in a patrol um, basically, you know, you'd have to, if a vehicle was getting too close to you, you'd have to um, either wave your hands and get their attention. If they didn't stop, you could do a warning shot in the air. Mm -hmm. If they still didn't stop, you can engage the um, engine block or the grill. And if they still didn't stop, you can engage the windshield. So there's a okay. lot of... Uh, Different of times. Mm -hmm. It's called you. escalation of force. Right. So, I mean, you try to use as many non-lethal interventions okay. as possible. Um, and then, yeah, you build up. But rules of engagement, I mean, they could be one thing on Monday mm -hmm. and be something by the next Monday. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could be completely flipped. Um, one of the most uh, non-lethal but certainly effective ways we used to do it was a pin flare. Mm -hmm. And so we would fire this flare. Um, it looked just like a tracer round. Okay. And so if a vehicle was approaching, we could fire that, ping it off their windshield, something okay. like that. Completely non-lethal, wouldn't hurt mm -hmm. anybody. Um, I remember using it on my first deployment. I remember using it for a part of my second deployment. And then at one point, they said, you can't use them anymore. I remember them saying that we didn't want to use them anymore because it was time to let the Iraqi people have their own control over their own country. Okay. And we didn't want to be an occupying force. There was even things about vehicles that were approaching you, how you could stop them. Mm -hmm. If they were on the other side of the highway, we would always stop them. But then if there was a, a guardrail or something, you couldn't stop them anymore. Wow, okay. That's hazardous to a vet. Yeah. That's hazardous to someone in Iraq because all they have to do is put a tri uh, pressure trigger on the mm -hmm. front bumper yeah. and just ram right into your convoy. Yeah. And they watch you nonstop. Yeah. So if they see you doing something one day and the next day they're not, mm -hmm. then they make an adjustment off yes. that. You know, so it's just kind of dumb sometimes <laughs> and any of you i mean did you ever get shot somebody shot at you oh people shot yeah. at us. yeah i um, never got injured though yeah i i caught some sh uh, rpg shrapnel uh okay. to my 
to my head. So, so I you, mean, it just it literally just knocked me out and uh, you know cracked the side of my midge. Okay. But um, you know, you get you get car bombs, you get IEDs, okay. you get RPGs, you get small arms fire. Okay, so you say you know it's serious. I mean, I, yeah. I, I like that. You know, as I say, I carry a gun because I want peace, and I hope I'm never going to use it. But it's a completely different scenario. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I hope I pray never going to face a, a real bullet face in my head because I think that would be giving me enough post-traumatic stress <laughs> just the, you know the, the thinking about that you know because something right. that uh, is going to stay with you forever let's talk about post-traumatic stress I mean mm-hmm. you guys what is your did you have any scars some mental scars or something that uh, you know you feel still that you need to somehow go through and this process of healing inside yeah. you yeah and I think that's one of the big reasons why you know we, we wanted to do this walk is you yeah. know because we both um, have experienced things. Um, can know. we share them? I mean, something sure. private. I don't want no, to ask no. you about it. I mean, I, I, I lost can... a, uh, my squad leader was killed in action. My platoon sergeant was killed in action. Um, my platoon sergeant's replacement, the very first day we went out, he caught uh, shrapnel through his temple, mm-hmm. uh, lost an eye uh, on the very first day. So, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've had friends that were killed in action, um, and those things kind of stick with you. So, um, and once you get home, there's not a lot of time to um, process that kind of stuff because you're um, thinking about going to school. You got to find a job. You have mm-hmm. to find a place to live. You just, you know, you're nonstop going. So you really don't have time to kind of uh, process war. Anthony, what's about I was, you? Well, I mean, I was diagnosed with post traumatic stress disorder after my first deployment. Um, that's why I think a lot of my friends and family were surprised when I volunteered to go back. Um, post traumatic stress disorder. You know, it can manifest itself in many ways. Mm-hmm. I had a lot of problems sleeping. I had a lot of problems. Like, my interpersonal skills were diminished quite a bit. Um, trying to just articulate a thought, let people know what I was thinking, feeling, things like that. They were gone. Um, a lot of emotional numbing. Pretty much the only pretty much the only emotion I could feel with any regularity was anger. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't differentiate the anger from legitimate anger versus something that maybe I was disappointed about. It would just go automatically up to 10 mm-hmm. and uh no one wanted to be around me and i didn't want to be around anyone else so i just kept myself away from everyone i'd go to work i'd go to school i'd do well i'd come home and i'd go into my basement and i'd just be there till it was time to go to sleep and sometimes i'd sleep down there i have even a more personal question okay and you don't have to answer to me because it's personal but you know i think every one of us maybe would like to ask you that you know because i would like to ask you mm-hmm. when you go to war you have to shoot somebody Okay. I mean, not you have to, but normally you are in a situation that you may face to defend your life or to finalize your mission. That's why you got a weapon, okay? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, myself, I can this face, imagine if I were in your shoes, you know, I go there and I, in a conflict, I hope that is going to be a fair shot. I mean, somebody that's shooting at me, I saw I shoot back and feel like, mm-hmm. but did you ever have to shoot, first of all, somebody? Um, personally, I, I don't think... I mean, it's it's really hard uh, to say. I've I mean, I've seen a lot of people shot, mm-hmm. uh, but personally, I don't think I have. Okay. Um, but I mean, it, it's you're just around. It's not like conventional war. No, I understand. You know? I understand. So, As I, I mean, say, this is just something that you know. It's, it's even if it's no war, it's still something. It's right. armed conflict. Okay, that's mm-hmm. why you have a weapon. Mm-hmm. And I think it's more than normal. Somebody shoot at me. I don't care why. I need to defend myself. Let's right. start with that. Mm-hmm. You know, I always visualize, you know, somebody's going there. And I, I don't want, sometimes, you know, can open bad memories. I right. don't want to go there. If you don't mm-hmm. want to, we can move on. But if you want to answer me, if in your experience, did you ever have to, to shoot? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yes, returning, yeah. returning okay. fire. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Okay. You? Yeah, definitely. Okay. And I know that, um, I know that, like, on convoys that I was in control of, stuff like that, that people people died from Mm -hmm. actions and commands that i gave stuff like that um i know that people have shot at me and i've shot back Mm -hmm. um but again it's not like it's not like what you see on tv where i see him he sees me we look at each other we shoot Mm -hmm. you know you don't line up like back in the revolutionary war days and you look at the person things are going yeah everything is going on all the time you never really never really know or at least in my experience you never really know exactly what you've done yeah um but there are things that you understand, yeah. you know, that you've been a part of and it doesn't always sit well. I understand because I'm not trying to even uh, be provocative. I just something that is a situation that most ro- normal person mm-hmm. never, had to, they can say, no, I, no, I never shot anybody because unless you're in a self-defense situation. Right. For a man or a woman going in an environment like that, 
I think just the fact that every hour, you know, if you go there, you start to shoot every day, it's something that it becomes into your, ingrained into your DNA or at least something that, oh my God, you know, I'm shooting people here. After all, mm -hmm. that's uh, the purpose of a weapon, you know? Right. So I, I mean, you can take it one step farther and say, um, when it comes to post-traumatic stress disorder, the things yeah. that you encounter, I mean, most people, when they decide, I'm hungry, I want to go get something to eat, yeah. maybe they want to walk down to the nearest restaurant. Uh -huh. There were times where we were walking to the defect, the dining facility, and you uh -huh. get mortared. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, like you don't, no. how do you try to relate that to yeah. an everyday experience? No, like, I know. It's, it's go okay. walk to McDonald's and someone's going to try to blow you up. At least I completely <laughs> understand that. And also another thing I would like to say, you know, if somebody puts you in that scenario, and I, you know, I just think... I talk to other veterans, like for example, people from Vietnam, okay? Mm -hmm. At that point, in my opinion, what I've seen is not more about what the politicians or the oh. media say, it's about yourself, your life, you wanna come back home, and more important, your brothers and sisters that depend on you, and that's what I would care at that point. Because your, your mindset goes to that before you ever step foot yeah. in the country, and it mm -hmm. never stops after yeah. you leave it. Because at, 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 become at this point, it's like uh, some sort of a brotherhood. Hey, guys, we're here, mm -hmm. we're stuck here, and we got to come back together as many as we can. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what, honestly, I feel after when I learn the rest of the story. Because after all, you know, at that point, you're there, and you want to come back. And the sad thing, you know, there's a lot of things you have to go through. Mm -hmm. to try to, to make it back. At least I have a song that I wrote uh, before I became a citizen. It's called The Wall, and I would like to dedicate it to you and to every soldier, American soldier, in the history of this country that uh, they've been fighting, uh, honoring the Constitution and defending the Constitution. More important, that they will never follow unconstitutional orders, okay? Mm -hmm. Because the bottom line is this one, and we'll talk later. I believe that uh, people like you guys that uh, took an oath uh, to defend the Constitution, and also the bravery to put yourself in harm's way, they are probably the most uh, important tool we have to defend this republic. That's why uh, governments, corrupted governments, hate you, or at least put you on the top list as potential domestic terrorists. But when you have knowledgeable people, they understand their rights and also understand the truth, and come back, and they start to speak up, and more important, they have the skills to defend freedom and liberty, that's the people we need back from around what, 128 uh, countries basis, we need them back home because the, the fight for freedom, in my opinion, it's happening right now here. I mean, they're completely enslaving us. So anyway, this is called The Wall. Hope you like it. And uh, if you don't, money back guarantee anyway, okay. loveguntsandfreedom.com. Let me get it going for you guys. We are the wall. We are the soldiers of the United States of America. That divides freedom from fear We separate your lives from the tears We are the wall that permits you to have fun We stand up strong when everybody runs Tears, blood, and pain. We are the wall. Don't make us die in vain. No. Play. Yeah. Yeah.
Ok, there was the wall, music and lyrics by myself, Luca Zanna, and if you want to support me, you can always do that. You can go to zanna.us or lovegunsfreedom.com, download any of my songs for just 99 cents. Differently from the government, we don't put a gun on your face to get your money, we just ask politely. Anyway, back to us. We have two great guests. I'm very excited because, you know, as already said, 1999, I was one step to become a soldier too, American mm -hmm. soldier. And I went to my little recruiting office and I talked to the people and, you know, today you're here and probably I would have been you, you know. So I feel this interview is more personal for me because probably I would have been now in your shoes. Maybe I don't know, walking all the way like you're doing, but, uh, my, you know, I really think that... Uh, I'm glad that you're here. That's what I want to say. You. Okay. Yeah, anyway, you. Anthony Anderson and Tom Voss, uh, just in case the listeners, they're just tuning in. They are walking 2,700 miles from w Milwaukee to Los Angeles, literally, to raise donations for dry hooch and awareness for veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. So this is, uh, you want to go to the website, veteranstrack.com, K, final K track.com and please support because every dollar goes to donate uh, to help uh, this organization now question i like these questions you know first of all what do you think about what happened in your opinion during 9 11 i mean a lot of stories the official story the book first of all do you know about wt7 the building the third building never was hit by any airplane yeah i know right about it. Mm -hmm. um i was 18 i was a freshman in college um, what do I think happened? Um, I don't know, but I remember on that day being especially struck by the fact that they found a uh, hijacker's passport after, you know, the fire got so hot that mm -hmm. it melted steel beams and took down big buildings. They found it in the rubble. I always, at 18 years old, I was like, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But I don't, I mean, I have no idea what happened. I just mm -hmm. think that... Uh, it became the basis for the wars that we fought in, the mm -hmm. wars that we'll continue to fight in, because now we have a global war on terror. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's about you? Um, yeah, I was in school. Um, I remember teachers rolling in, um, you know, TVs for us to watch what's going on. And um, it really wasn't until um, after uh, my military service and stuff that I kind of started, you know, looking more into um, what had happened. And, and I don't know... Um, exactly what happened, but um, you know, some things don't add up. So Exactly, and that's my point, because you know, I don't know exactly what happened, but let's put it in this show. We have a brain, we have mm -hmm. a logic, right. we know that something wasn't the way they told us, for example. And this is not about 9-11 today, but since uh, most of the conflict that we went through, and so many other millions of veterans, was justified by 9-11, and we know that Mr. Bush, President W. Bush, said that uh, Iraq, in his personal 2009, I guess, uh, press uh, conference, wasn't connected to 9-11, and weapons of mass destruction, we need to investigate what really happened because otherwise we give them, uh, you know, opening to all the things they're doing to us. For example, like now the new police state, you know, the Patriot Act, NDA, we will talk in a second. So all I want to say to the listeners, please, please don't shut down when you hear this word, 9-11, think about the conspiracy, uh, you know, try to put us all under this umbrella conspiracy because it's vital to know the truth. Otherwise, people, millions of people like us, Americans, and the rest of the world, also in our veterans, we are all doing this because of 9-11. Or at least we are facing this type of reality because of 9-11. So I always say there is a joke. It is not a joke. Two airplanes, three buildings goes down. Something doesn't add up right there. WT7, people Google it, watch the video, and that's number one lie. Number two, the Pentagon, okay? Uh, you will see in the first few minutes from CNN, there is a, after the Pentagon got hit, there is a, a hole, it's about 15 feet, okay? No airplane disappear, no, air, no engines. We're talking about titanium engine, they completely dissolve. Then the, uh, the hole in the Pentagon starts to crack down, it gets a little bigger, but still there is no traces of any debris. The cameras, I mean, there are like millions of uh, questions that we never had answers, you know? But it's important that our duty as a citizen to really want to help you, that's the way I look at this. I want to know the truth and spread the truth because I want to say, guys, before you go out there and die for somebody, I want to know that is the right reason, you know. So that's what I'm saying. We don't have the whole hour to talk about 9-11, but I want just to touch it for a second. 
What do you think, guys, about... Uh, have you ever heard about in the 90s, 1994, May, uh, there was... Uh, the famous 29 Palms, California survey, it's a combat arms survey that was administered to 300 active duty Marines, uh, pretty much says, you know, the question was, um, would you disarm American citizen? And uh, would you pretty much serve under the United Nations? Did you ever heard about this survey? No, mm -mm. I never did. No. And I, I please, you know, because there was probably another generation ago, you know, where mm -hmm. he's still young. Man. I, was, I was 11. Yes. <laughs> yeah, me too. You know, I, I mean, I was a little older than you, but mm -hmm. I heard these things. And I invite you to share this with your veterans' friends. And uh, because what happened already in the 90s, they were trying to see which soldier, who's, who was the soldier that was able to say, forget the Constitution, I will follow orders of a global government and among those to disarm people. By the way, are you aware that we have right now a special agreement with FEMA, from the FEMA website, please listeners listen to this, with Russian troops. The Russian military now can be used for any emergency situation on U.S. soil, according to FEMA, under FEMA. Mm, nope. No, I'm not too familiar with it, but I'm not very comfortable with it. Either. Yeah, <laughs> and are you familiar that we have Chinese troops right now for the first time in the U.S. history, arms? Chinese troops in Hawaii, stationed in Hawaii. I've heard oh. about that. Okay. So, I mean, that's why I think you are a threat. Mm -hmm. Because if you got 20 millions of you guys coming back from wherever you were and a little bit of knowledge, educated, and not to the Constitution, you love your country, you love your fellow Americans, I mean, you, you were already ready to die before. Now, when you see that we've been taking over and we are some part of in danger, if I was a foreign country, the first thing I would do I will collect all the database of all the veterans in the U.S. I want to know where you live, where you are, what are your problems. And you know that uh, more than a few times, the last few years, uh, many uh, computers, laptop, yeah. disappear. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I, I uh, got a letter from the VA saying that my information had been stolen, but mm -hmm. they offered me six months of free life lock, so oh, I felt pretty great. good about it. <laughs> Thank uh <-huh>. you. <laughs> Thank you. Me, me why they want to take your gun back, but yeah. uh, away, yeah. but they give you a life lock. Yeah, and I mean, we've he we hear about um, you know them them mulling around with the idea that they want to take uh, you know weapons away from veterans with post traumatic stress mm -hmm. disorder. So I read stories, uh, not even read. I saw letters from some veterans receiving a letter from the VA, just because they were treating them with post traumatic stress. No judge, no jury, no real evaluation. You must get. Turn your guns in. There was, yeah. a, I can get you all to the links if you want. There are more than one veteran out there. So you didn't get any letters yet, right? No, no all right. I wouldn't even pay attention to Good. that if Good. I did get one. Excellent. I like that spirit. <laughs> That's the spirit I like. <laughs> so, talking about this now, what if tomorrow, uh, you know, we're here in America and uh, pretty much they come and they start to say, okay, everybody must turn your guns in, okay? And um, what is your line in the sand? Are you going to comply with that? Are you going to register your guns? Are you? No, the no. Constitution says I have a right to keep it. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so you must be really a domestic terrorist. You know, you believe no. in the Constitution. <laughs> I mean, and all yeah, this stuff. No. I mean, uh, I, um, I mean, just from like my my personal opinion is that um, you don't have a right to it. I'm not a felon. Mm -hmm. I don't have any criminal history. Yep. I've never made threats to anyone. I've never used it in a the commission of a crime, I'm not a suspect of any crime, nothing like that, so there's really no grounds to take it. Um, plus, like, I paid for it. <laughs> exactly, so I like my, that. That's, so I paid my, for it, that's my so property. It's my property. <laughs> exactly. Right? Please, then, guys, it's already an hour gone. One more word before we go. One word. Go, Tom. Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for uh, supporting us on this track. Anthony. I would, I would say uh, be agents of change, not just advocates for it. Hey, thank you guys. I love you, okay? Hey. Thank you. Appreciate it.